We're going to be talking about a new Apache project, which is called OpenWhisk. Is this a, a new project to you? Did anyone hear about OpenWhisk? Cool. All right. So it's uh, not really, really, really new. OpenWhisk is an Apache incubating project. It's a serverless open source cloud platform that executes functions in response to events. So why is it that we are at a Mesos conference managing servers, and yet we're talking about serverless? And I have three factors that I think are important when we think of serverless. I, I would say the first one that is a driving factor for serverless is the user experiences. We're probably still familiar with those old times. I should say once upon a time, we had these big desktop machines and the user experience was limited to, the, to that desktop machine. Then we had some modems and then we had a little bit of connectivity and uh, we had these big um, applications in the back end. Then mobile apps came into the picture. Really cool. We ported some of the desktop capabilities on the mobile and in the server it also made sense to split the monoliths into smaller pieces. I believe that starting with this year, we're, we're seeing something uh, new coming. And that's mainly driven by voice, AR, and VR. I think that these three are probably going to dominate the next generation of um, user experiences. So one particular thing about voice is that the interactions are shorter. Uh, you could be in your hotel room and uh, maybe speak with the digital assistant, uh, check on the weather, check on local events, restaurants, which ones are popular, um, make a reservation, um, maybe call uh, the reception desk, whatever, you know, short interactions. But in these few examples that I gave with my voice, I was able to touch on so many systems, weather, reservations, events, uh, hotel services. So voice is pretty magical. But not all experiences are real time. Uh, imagine that we're at an event and we use the phone, we take pictures. Those pictures are synchronous, asynchronously copied into the cloud, backed up. And then while they're into the cloud, there's a whole process happening. We have workers that can look at the pictures. We have uh, the, those events queued into a queue. And then from the queue, a microservice consumes events, processes them, and maybe looks at the pictures. Where, where was it taken? Uh, face recognition, friends, and, and so on. So I guess the point that I'm trying to make is that the, the richer and the, the more diverse the user experiences, the more complex the services in the, in the back end become. And I'm really building a case for serverless here, so if you bear, bear with me. So the first, the first factor, user experiences. The second one, and we are familiar with this one, the time, how long it takes right now to provision some compute capacity. We went from days, if not more, to provision bare metal servers to VMs, minutes, probably seconds in some cases, but I'll, I'll say rather minutes, then containers. And I'm sure using Mesos, we're very familiar and excited with, with these containers. Well, so serverless is just a tiny little step forward on how much it takes to, to provision resources. And we're going to look at some real demos this evening. The last uh, point that I want to bring is product extensibility. This is is not generally uh, spoken about at the... Um, <laughs> I would say general serverless platforms like Amazon Lambda, uh, Azure Functions. Um, that would be, I would categorize it as general purpose serverless. But there's cases, and Adobe falls under this case, where we have a platform, we have services in the cloud, and we want to make it easy for developers to be able to extend them. And we started with APIs like anybody else, right? APIs, great. Then we went into the real time aspect. We realized that there are events, people, creatives put pictures into the creative cloud, they generate events. And we said, yeah, we're gonna make not just APIs, but webhooks, and they're great. But webhooks, they, even though they're, they're simple, you still need to care about what's happening, how and how do you handle the webhook and the event. And serverless provides an answer to this. So serverless gives 
not just Adobe, but whoever wants to install such a platform, the capability for developers to write a piece of code, extend the platform, and integrate it with any other SaaS systems that they're interested in. After these three, I, I would say that the modern apps have a richer UX, are smaller, composable, and have this real-time aspect. And without further ado, I'm going to jump into the first of the four demos that we're going to run today. And I'm going to show an example with Adobe Analytics. And I'm going to use my voice to get some data out. Of course, I'm uh, limited to the internet, so I hope it works. I have on my phone an Alexa user interface. It's an application called Reverb. And I'm going to have a dialogue with Alexa. Um, I wouldn't ask if you are using Adobe Analytics. I will assume we didn't use, but I so happened that somebody installed uh, Adobe Analytics in my, in my web page, and now I want to, I'm curious how many page views I got last week or visitors. So without, having, without being skilled on the user interface, I'm just going to ask Alexa. So, Alexa, ask Adobe Analytics. Welcome to Adobe Analytics. Which report suite would you like to use? Summit Demo 2017, Template Report Suite. Demo. Okay, using the Summit Demo 2017 Report Suite, how can I help you? How many page views last week? The total number of page views is 1,658. Cool. How many visitors last month? The total number of visitors last month was 11,799. Thank you. All right. So as you can see, I just showcase some very simple things that we, we could do with serverless. And this runs, uh, the demo runs in OpenWhisk, by the way. Um, and you know, I just demoed a very simple interaction. It's real time, I was able to get an answer back from a very complex system. This is what happened. I gave a voice command, it went to the Echo, Amazon Echo, it circled back to Adobe IO, it got a response back, right. Now, let's, look a little bit inside Apache OpenWhisk, and I'm going to hand the microphone over to Tyson, my colleague. Um, we're both working for this team in Adobe that is called Adobe IO, and we're the interface between Adobe services and third-party developers. Thank you. So um, I want to talk a little bit about uh, what OpenWhisk is, uh, how it works, and the kind of steps that we're taking to uh, leverage Mesos underneath it. So uh, some of this is kind of uh, um, marketing speak for um, OpenWhisk, but Apache OpenWhisk is a serverless open source cloud platform that executes functions in response to events in Docker containers. And part of what it provides is a command line and an API for function management. So really, it gives you the vehicle to deploy um, pieces of code, whether they're small or large, into Docker containers in a generic way. So uh, I want to talk a little bit about some, some concepts and terminology that are used in OpenWIS to kind of outline how we have started leveraging mes Mesos within. So this is a simplistic uh, architecture diagram of, of OpenWhisk, how it operates without uh, Mesos in the picture. So you can see um, from a internet um, uh, connection, there's uh, the, the first entry point into the OpenWhisk system is, is to the controller. Um, this is for the execution type of workflow, not the function administration workflow, but for the execution, uh, events come in and are queued in Kafka, and eventually they're, they're processed by a component that's called in OpenWIS as the invoker. And the invoker uh, natively speaks to Docker client and launches containers, ex executes functions based on the request, um, resubmits the response back to Kafka, 
response is picked up by the controller and sent back to the client if there's somebody waiting, or it just keeps the response for itself if, if nobody's waiting for it. So this is fine, but let's talk about open with scaling. So in order to add an invoker, what happens is this whole invoker host block in the diagram gets duplicated. Another topic on the Kafka broker gets created. And the controller has to manage knowing how many invokers are in the systems, um, what actions have been executed so that there can be some amount of optimization on routing. Um, but it's not, it's not easy. So uh, what I was just talking about, like when you add, a, when you add the invoker, uh, he advertises himself in Kafka, and that's how the controller discovers, monitors, monitors its health via Kafka. But why, we're all here because we're, we're a Meso shop, and we really don't want to have competing cluster resource managers. So in OpenWIS, the invoker is effectively a resource manager who considers that he's the, he's the owner of all Docker containers on a, any particular host. Um, and this sounds really familiar to Mesos operators who know that when a Mesos agent is on the host, he typically operates in the same fashion, considering himself as the owner of all the Docker containers on the host. So we don't want competing clusters. We don't want competing container managers. We want to use Mesos to manage the cluster. And yes, we can. We just have to make some minor changes in OpenWhisk to do this. So I want to go into some details on how we're doing that. So first of all, it's important to know that OpenWhisk components are uh, written as ACA applications. Um, and this is um, helpful because it makes it easier to um, decompose the application in a way that we can um, use messaging to drive the interactions in between the components. So the steps that we're taking are um, we want to use OpenWhisk to um, uh, launch the Docker containers, but do it via Mesos. And so what we're going to do is we're going to use a Mesos actor um, inside the, app, the ACA applications that OpenWhisk is running for the controller and the invoker components. So the first question is, what, what do, where do we find a Mesos actor? So after looking at some of the existing clients, dealing with things like managing libmesos, um, revving the client with the Mesos um, uh, versions um, becomes a little disheartening to try and build. It's, it's the classic, it's difficult to build a Mesos framework story. So what we did was we started uh, from scratch a Mesos actor that behaves um, based on the uh, Mesos scheduler HTTP API. And what we end up with is a single actor that enc encapsulates the interactions with the Mesos HTTP API. We can drop that actor into an ACA application and start behaving, causing that application to behave as a Mesos framework with doing very little work. So when it goes through some details on um, how we're building the Mesos ac actor. So this is a, um, a diagram of, outside of OpenWhisk um, concepts, how does the Mesos actor behave? And some of these concepts will look very similar to the scheduler Java API and the scheduler HTTP API. Um, but in general, the, the, the life cycle of the actor uh, begins with a subscription. So you can send the actor a subscribe message. Um, once the subscription is complete, you can send the actor a task submission message. Um, you can receive task state messages um, as tasks are 
changing state within the Mesos system. Um, and then you can submit delete task and, and tear down the framework. So you can see how um, really interacting with the Mesos scheduler API really becomes an exercise in ACA messaging at this point. So um, I'm going to go through a short demo on um, the Mesos actor. Thank you for holding the mic. So what we have over here is my Mesos cluster. And you can see I don't have any active tasks. So over here in IntelliJ, can everybody see this OK? Um, I have a, a, a simple application. I just called it sample framework. And you can see, so my code for starting up is just instantiating the actor, giving it a framework ID, um, pointing out where the Mesos master resides, um, giving it a failover timeout. Uh, very simple. Uh, once it subscribes, I want to I receive a message for um, subs subscribe complete. And after I subscribe, I just launch some tasks here. And you know, this is the piece that's, that's just not that easy to do with the scheduler API um, in, in a lot of ways. Um, but we've kind of encapsulated the HTTP stream interaction um, behind this, this other, um, uh, this Mesos client actor here. So when I run this, I'm just running this locally. And what will happen is over in my Mesos cluster, my, my application that's behaving as a framework will start launching tasks. And the way that the application is written, it just simply launches some tasks, waits a few seconds, and then kills some tasks. But you can see how we've gone, gone a long ways for consuming the, the Mesos scheduler API in, in a few short steps. So now my task just got killed. And my, my application completed, and it tore itself down as a framework uh, inside of Mesos. So this is our really simple example. Now, The next, the next thing that we want to go through is, so it's, it's, it's great that we can launch tasks in Mesos now, but that's, that's not really a reliable framework. And so some of the things that we're adding are um, dealing with um, highly available frameworks. So um, you know, we know that when, when the framework is running and, um, and it, it crashes or disconnects or um, goes through a partition. Um, we need to we need to fix that and have a new instance that becomes um, the manager of the tasks that this framework has launched. And so the next thing I want to show is going through a um, a different version of a sample that will deploy an ACA cluster application. And we're going to use ACA clustering to establish who is the leader and who should be managing the tasks at any given time. Um, and as a cluster, these instances will work together so that if the leader becomes disconnected, another member of the cluster will take over and be able to have um, some continuity in the task management for this particular framework. So when I launch this application, yeah. So now my ACA cluster is coming up. And if I go, oops. Sorry, yeah. So now I can see that my cluster has started. So if I look in these tasks, 
I uh, can see that one of them will be the leader and is subscribing. So this one has the most log messages. So we happen to know that that's a good indicator that he's now receiving offers from Mesos. So that's great. So now he has the ability to launch tasks. But what if, what if he crashes? So if we go back. This this one, 11014. So if we go over to Marathon and we choose him and we say, well, let's just kill that guy. So let's see. OK. So now Marathon is taking over uh, relaunching one of our instances. And now if we go back to the Mesos UI, Oh, now we have four instances. So now we have four instances running. I'm not sure how we ended up with four. But we can come back here and look for another one who has taken over as the leader. So this guy was a leader momentarily. Let's see. No. Sorry, we don't have a we don't have a great way to pick out which one is the leader without looking through the logs at this point. So, um, so you can see uh, one of these tasks that um, is running now has taken over the responsibilities um, of being a leader. And you can see in the logs here where the ACA cluster listener is, is announcing um, that the leader changed. And what's happening here is that um, each instance will, um, if it becomes a leader, what it will do is it will determine the framework ID that was used during the last subscription by a distributed data store in ACA. And um, it will resubscribe itself as the framework with that same ID. And therefore, it will, um, according to Mesos, it will, it will reattach um, and be treated as, as a failover. And if I go to um, frameworks, I still have my, um, my, my sample framework running. And so the task that it, that it might have launched um, can be reconciled with it. Um, but the main idea here is that we're using ACA clustering to um, resolve uh, failovers within the, within the cluster to, so that we can reattach an instance as the, the new leader for this particular framework instance. Oops. So just recapping some features that we talked about. Um, uh, there's leader election based on ACA clustering. Um, we resubscribe uh, a, a new leader that um, has been determined after there's a, there's a failover. Um, the framework ID has to be consistent between um, uh, a leader failover and a leader election so that the same tasks can be reassociated with the new uh, framework instance. Um, and there's uh, uh, support for Mesos roles in case um, people are allocating resources based on role and having a framework identify itself as, as operating in a particular role. Some things that are not done yet with this um, actor implementation is the reconcile process. So in the case where an um, instance of a clustered framework has failed, its tasks are not currently um, reconciled when, when the new instance resubscribes. Um, and then also um, sharing task state so that that reconcile uh, can happen. So getting back to OpenWhisk, because um, that's what we're really talking about, um, what, oh, we have a typo here. Um, <laughs> well, we, so um, a service platform on Mesos, massive scale operators expand and contract a Mesos cluster. Um, so what, 
what alterations do we need to actually do in OpenWIST to support this type of uh, Mesos actor to control our containers? So in the controller, uh, if you recall the, the diagram with OpenWIST components, the, the facade for incoming requests is the controller. There's not any uh, container interactions in that component currently. Um, the, the containers are all interacted with in the invoker. So what we've done in OpenWhisk is define a, uh, an interface in the invoker for um, encapsulating what a container factory is. And so the out-of-box OpenWhisk system will use uh, Docker CLI as a container factory. So it just assumes that it has access to Docker, can, can run Docker and, and run C commands on Docker containers. In our case, we're going we're gonna to use the Mesos actor to, uh, to create and kill containers within the system. So here's the diagram that we had where uh, before, um, within OpenWhisk, the invoker is, is communicating directly with Docker. Um, after we integrate with Mesos, we're not going to leverage Docker at all anymore. We're going to have the invoker communicate with Mesos. And the invoker is going to be elevated to the, the status of a Mesos framework. And so if we compare these, this is just kind of pointing out to be uh, clear that no longer is invoker um, going to be leveraging these, these Docker-specific um, CLI, and it's going to delegate to, to uh, Mesos. So, um, now I was going to show a demo of, of exactly what happens in OpenWIS when we do this. So if we go, oops. So the way that OpenWIS operates is by a concept of actions from a developer perspective. So if you look over in my terminal here, I have this uh, JavaScript snippet. And this is what I want to run as a uh, function in OpenWhisk. So what I'm going to do is first I need to start my invoker, which was already running as a container. I'm just going to restart it. Now remember this invoker is going to be operating now as a uh, a Mesos framework. And so you'll see it here in the, in the framework section of the Mesos UI. So that's good. And now if I go back to my list of tasks, you can see that there's some tasks that were created by my OpenWhisk framework. They're, they're prefixed with this WHISK load balancer ID. And the reason these tasks are created is because OpenWhisk does some optimization to um, speed up the code initialization process by starting some containers uh, so that they're pre-warmed. And once code arrives to be executed, it doesn't have to start the container. Um, it, if a container is available for running, it will just inject the code into it and run it. So now um, what I'll do is create my action. So I'm listing my actions. Currently, there's some tests there. So now I'm going to go, uh, I'm going to say action, create, hello. OK. So now if I list my actions, so now you'll see I have a hello action up here. And now if I invoke my action, what you'll see is in my action, what I did was I um, returned a string, uh, actually a JSON um, result, 
which indicates what task it was running on. So incidentally, if I go over to my Mesos UI and look at the logs for that tasks, I'll see some indication of a log message that was also generated in that task, as well as this is a marker that OpenWIS uses to, to look at the end of the log file. And if I go back, you'll notice that now instead of four tasks, I have five tasks because once I start consuming containers inside of OpenWISC, it will try and launch additional containers so that it has a steady pool of pre-warm containers available for new actions that might come in that need to be executed. And it does some optimization to try and reuse containers for the same action so that the same code is, is, is not reinitialized more often than necessary. But this is our demo for OpenWhisk. And let's see. Thank you for coming. Um, if anybody has any questions, I think we can go to the questions now. So this might come from me not being completely familiar with ECHA cluster. How do you manage uh, cluster membership? You, uh, and um, is your uh, Invoker framework um, a Mesos actor that you just presented? So by how I mean, do you coordinate uh, through Zookeeper? I think I think a cl cluster can do that, or multicast, or what, 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 how does this all come together? That's a great point, actually. And uh, it was on my tongue. I, I wanted also also to mention, I think uh, the reason why I personally got so excited about Aka working again this, this year with it is that we didn't need to use any Zookeeper. Aka clustering knows, um, has a nice, uh, nice algorithms. Uh, it uses gossip to know about the nodes in the, in, in the cluster. And it is capable, it has algorithms to pick a leader. So then what we do is that once Aka picks a leader, that's the node that is going to listen as a Mesos framework. Yeah, and we're, I'm personally very excited about this because I don't have to depend on Zookeeper and do all that or orchestration. Is uh, As a developer, when I work with Aka, I, I feel I have so much power now that somebody else implemented some algorithms for me, and now I, I just look very like I'm very smart, but I j all, all I do is just use Aka. <laughs> so the, the one thing that I would point out is, uh, so I highlighted a, a very specific piece of code here. So ACA does operate off the notion of seed nodes to define how a cluster is initialized. And what we're doing here is we're leveraging Marathon's application state to determine what the seed nodes are. And once we determine that there are some seed nodes and that the seed nodes are healthy, then we initialize the clustering based on everybody gets the same set of seed nodes, and it has its own gossip protocol to establish who is the leader at that point. Yes. Um, how do you plan on uh, keeping up with um, currency? So when OpenWhisk uh, changes version or Mesos uh, changes version, is there much work in, in to upgrade your code? So the way that um, this is a complicated answer because um, the way that OpenWhisk is operated today um, is, is going to be different probably in the future. But the way that it operates today, there's the controller component and there's the invoker component. And strictly speaking, we can, we can rev those independently. And so while the incoming facade um, you know, the controller can be at one version. We can do a rolling upgrade of the invokers, um, and then we'll be doing a rolling upgrade of the controllers. But the, the, the short answer is that, that we will have to do um, coordinated rolling upgrades of each component. Uh, so if I understand correctly, Invoker will actually um, natively manage the Docker containers and uh, to do actions, and you modify it to uh, talk to Mesos and uh, leverage Mesos capability to manage containers. So I would imagine it would be nice to abstract that 
like adapter layer away, so uh, Invoker could not only talk to Docker daemon or Mesos or Kubernetes or Swarm, and you have these interfaces so that it can, lev can be leveraged to manage the containers, right? So you, then th that API work could be like upstream back to OpenWorld's community. It is, and you're, you're right, and it is. Um, so. There's, um, we're working with the OpenWIS community right now. Um, there's an open pull request that's nearing completion for the container factory. Um, um, we are in um, close contact with a team at Red Hat who's doing the same for Kubernetes. Um, and you're right, um, it's, it's, a, it's a generic API for launching containers with OpenWIS semantics. Um, but there is um, there's no exposure of uh, of Mesos dependencies upwards from that API. Okay, great, thanks. Mm -hmm. Cool, that was a great talk. Thank you. So, a uh, couple of quick questions. One is the invoker is still the one that's reading the data from Kafka and invoking the actions, right? That's correct. So the, um, after it got integrated with the, I mean, the invoker itself is becoming a framework right now. Yes. So the, all of the actions get deployed in its own container, I assume. So how are you guys also scaling the invoker, and how is the actions from the invoker um, gets called on the actual yeah, uh, so, container? So this is, um, uh, it's, so the way the invoker is scaled today is if you are constrained by the number of containers based on the number of hosts that run an invoker, your, your choice today is to deploy a new host which also has another invoker on it. Right. When we're operating the invoker as a Mesos framework, there's no real need for multiple invokers anymore. The invoker now has visibility to the entire Mesos cluster the only reason that we have to operate multiple invokers at this point is to have a highly available system so that if one of those invokers fails, the controller will route all of its requests to the other invokers. Um, but the, the ratio of invokers to hosts is no longer relevant, specifically for scaling out containers. Got it. So that means each of these individual containers can also subscribe to Kafka directly to receive their own messages. Um, or invoker is still in the middle of getting the messages. The invoker is still in the middle of oh, see, of okay. processing the messages. Okay. Which Incidentally, is, yeah. we are we are working on some other throughput optimizations that are specifically related to how um, um, function invocations are passed through Kafka and and processed at the invoker layer. That's cool. Where effectively what we want to do is share the um, container pool state of the entire cluster from OpenWIS perspective all the way back to the controller so that we can really optimize how the, th how, you know, how the throughput is managed in the system. If I, can, if I can just add, because I like your question. Uh, you know, this is the beauty of Mesos, that it takes away the container management in the cluster, and we can focus on what, what, what is the core of a serverless, and actually at the core, what we want to get to is even use machine learning to spin up containers ahead of time, pre-worm, do all, all these other things, and offload the complexity of the managing of the containers to Mesos. Cool, thank you. So thank you for the question. I like this. Uh, just one last one, and then we'll wrap up. Um, if, if we're in an environment with a universal a containerizer runtime, UCR, no Docker, should this work? Not. Um, uh, well, I don't know. Um, I was going to say no, but um, that's, not, that's not really true. Okay. Um, we're, we're not operating that way, but um, in theory, it should work because as long as the container that's, that's surfaced as a Mesos task has a, a routable IP and a port, it's in theory fine. Related question, like if, you do, if we're doing IP per container with Calico, no overlay, or just layer three, is there any network implication? Should work, right? Yeah. Yeah, there's, there's, yeah so this is um, actually one really nice thing about um, OpenWhisk currently is that um, the, 
um, the, the interface that's required of a, of a container from an OpenWISP perspective is strictly defined only as an HTTP interface that has a, um, a slash run endpoint on it. And as, as long as your container ends up with that contract in mind, then technically speaking, there's not really any reason OpenWISP can't execute it. I also point that you said you're with uh, Calico. Using Calico. Oh, using Calico, yeah, it would be a great addition to OpenWIS to re learn how to isolate containers from from each other. You see, this is yet another thing that a serverless environment needs to look at. So, thank you for the question. Thank you, guys. All right, thank you very much for your time.